let me begin uh, by thanking uh, Virtual uh, Health Centers Health uh, Facility CEO Dennis Poyan uh, for joining us, as well as New Jersey Department of Health uh, Commissioner Judy Persicelli. Uh, I won't steal the governor's thunder and say the woman who needs no introduction, but I think all of us are, are well aware of the great work of our health commissioner and all she's doing. Um, and thank you both for agreeing to, to participate in this important uh, discussion. So the purpose of our conversation here today is to encourage people, um, especially those in the African-American community to get vaccinated. Um, and understand, understandably, there is vaccine hesitancy in our community, uh, but we must work to inform people about the safety and efficacy of the vaccine. And as we all know, the pandemic has had a devastating impact uh, in the black community. Uh, people of color uh, have been disproportionately impacted. Um, as a few statistical points, uh, African Americans make up about 14% of our state's population, yet statewide they account for 12% of total cases and 17% of total deaths. Here in Burlington County, where I live, Black residents accounted for 20% of all positive cases. So in sum, African Americans are more likely to be impacted by COVID-19 because they are three times more likely to contract the disease, four times more likely to be hospitalized, and three times more likely to die from it. So today's conversation is critically important and very timely in the nature of what we wanna talk about. So I'd like to begin um, just by a little personal note. I, I uh, publicly received my first vaccine uh, shot uh, last month. And I did that purposefully um, at the Burlington County mega site. But I did this to encourage uh, so many about the trust the science and get vaccinated because if we are to proceed out of where we're at into a new normal we have to do that and it's critically important that we do that in, in my experience uh, i had no negative effects of it the process i will tell you is just so smooth over at the burlington county uh, mega site run by virtual hospital under the leadership great leadership of its ceo dennis pullen who has done he, uh, just a Herculean effort, he and his team, of putting this together and having Virtual be such a great partner in running that site. So, so Dennis, first of all, again, thank you for being with us. And I want to know if you could spend just a few minutes uh, telling everyone how the mega site works, what they can expect when they get there, and most importantly, how to get a, an appointment uh, through, through the mega site. Uh, thank you, uh, thank Senator, you. And, and thank you to the commissioner and the Department of Health really for this opportunity to, to talk about this just vital topic. You know, as the CEO of a health system, I feel a responsibility to be a visible and vocal advocate for these vaccines. You know, it's critical that our communities of color recognize how important these COVID-19 vaccines are. You know, especially as, as you mentioned, Senator, that we are disproportionately impacted by this awful virus. You know, there's still a tremendous amount of distrust and skepticism, and, and some of it is rooted in a painful part of our history. But in this moment, I think we must speak to one another and support one another to try and establish trust. You know, like you, I've been vaccinated, um, doing so, allowed me to safely round at our hospitals and to visit our frontline staff and patients. But it also allowed me, I think, to serve as an example. And I hope people will choose to, to follow my example and protect themselves by way of this vaccine. So I, I appreciate having the opportunity to speak to you about the Burlington County mega site and the process of getting vac vaccinated. You know, the, Ver the Burlington County mega site is one of six mega sites in the state. You know, while it may be named for its county, it serves the entire region. And it's not limited to just Burlington County residents. You know, the mega site is located at the Morristown Mall, you know, which provides plenty of parking and it's accessible by public transportation. But I, I really wanna point out that the mega site is a partnership. You know, many groups contributes to its success. The New Jersey Department of Health, Burlington County, 
New Jersey All Hazard Incident Management Team, New Jersey Office of Emergency Management, the New Jersey National Guard, and then of course, uh, virtual health. We're now vaccinating, Senator, thousands of people every day, seven days a week. You know, the Burlington County mega site have exceeded over 4,000 doses in a single day on several occasions. You know, this really surpasses our initial goal at the mega site was to, to be able to do roughly about 2,400 doses in a day. And the, I don't know if I would say the beauty of it, but the, the truth of the matter is we've yet to reach our full capacity. You know, as vaccine supply expands, we'll also expand our operations accordingly. And to those people that are waiting for an appointment, I, I'd just like to say, please know that your, your turn will come because we are looking forward to taking care. I know a lot of people have many questions when it comes to registering for an appointment. And appointments are important. I, I want to make sure that I highlight that. Important appointments are important because the vaccine needs to be stored in a specific way. And we usually only have enough dosage on site for the people with appointments. And so everyone in the region that is interested should visit virtua.org slash vaccine. They can fill out a form that will allow them to receive an alert when new vaccines appointments are, are added to the schedule. Um, you know, it's well reported that there is a, a far greater demand for vaccine than there is supply right now. But I wouldn't let that deter anyone from registering. You know, will it take time? Yes. And, and perhaps maybe over several months. But our pace will quicken as the vaccines become more widely available to us. And I think the commissioner will probably um, speak to that a bit. But the vaccinations, Senator, they're safe and effective. And I think you will hear also on this call um, from others. I, I just wanna stress that people should use this opportunity to protect themselves, to protect their families and our wider community. And so I am really appreciative of the fact to be able to be a part of your panel to really address some of those concerns and hopefully provide some clarity um, to those that that are watching. Dennis, thank you. Um, obviously, your your role and involvement of Virtuous Health System uh, at the Burlington County mega site is critically important. And, and we do remind everyone to please go to Virtuous website um, and, and set up for the appointments. You, we cannot get you vaccinated if you don't have an appointment, which right. is the first step. And the conversation here today is not just about talking about in generalities, but it's trying to move folks, especially people of color who have this hesitation that you've talked about because of some of the tortured and painful history of medical experimentation and some of the healthcare uh, issues in our country to move beyond that. Because in order for us to, to all be safe, to all take care of one another, we have to get in line get our, and get vaccinated so we can move forward. So, so thank you uh, for that. Uh, one of the things that you touched on and, and I'm so honored to have the commissioner of the Department of Health with us. Uh, one of the things you touched on was vaccine supply. And commissioner, it, it, if you could, I'd love for you to take a minute to just give us sort of a 50,000 foot overview of sort of where we are at. Um, and then if you, if you could, I'd love for you to pivot to help us dispel some of the myths about vaccine safety because there is a hesitation in, in, in a lot of communities, right? There's a lot of hesitation, but there's awful. Uh, there's also an awful lot, an uh, awful amount of misinformation that is being out there and perpetuated by some for whatever reason. So if you could, Commissioner, again, thank you for being here. General overview, and then talk to us a little bit about vaccine safety, Commissioner. Thank you so much, uh, Senator Singleton, and for hosting this discussion and, and for your ongoing and continued advocacy for the health and welfare of the people in New Jersey. 
Uh, I also want to thank the virtual health uh, CEO, Dennis Pullen, uh, for the hospital system support of the Burlington County site. Uh, it's uh, one of our mega sites. It's doing very, very well uh, in serving as a vaccination hub, and we can't thank you enough for your collaboration in this regard. You know, with every vaccination given, we come closer to the light at the end of the tunnel, where we can move beyond this epidemic and hopefully approach a future better than the present that we're living in right now. It's an incredible scientific achievement that a safe and effective vaccine has become available in the same year that this pandemic hit. A large scale vaccination program is a massive undertaking. Uh, scarcity of vaccine has challenged our nation and definitely has challenged our state. There's a tremendous demand and supply imbalance uh, that we are dealing with at this time, but we do expect increasing amounts of vaccine over the next several months. And I can guarantee that everyone who wants to get vaccinated will get vaccinated in our state. Our strategic aims of our program are first to provide equitable access to the residents of New Jersey. Secondly, is to achieve community protection. Some of you may know the term herd immunity. And thirdly, and most importantly, and why today this roundtable is so important, it's to build sustainable trust in COVID-19 vaccine, but also to start building trust in other vaccines as well. We began our largest vaccination program in New Jersey's history just about two months ago on December 15. We gave our first uh, shot in the arm uh, to a, uh, a Latina uh, woman, a uh, nurse at University Hospital in Newark. Since that date, we have administered 1,821,510 doses of vaccine. Over 250,000 doses have been administered in our nursing homes. Over 1.2 million New Jersey residents have completed their two dose regimen. So we are on our way to community protection. However, the vaccine rates and colors of community lag behind the representative numbers of those communities in New Jersey. We recognize that there's a level of mistrust and resistance to the COVID-19 vaccine and other vaccines across our communities of color due to longstanding inequities and in the history of trials, clinical trials in our nation. Our work is to build confidence and trust, not only in this vaccine, but in vaccines into the future. We're working with health professionals, faith and community leaders that represent communities of color to dispel the myths and share facts about the vaccine. The department wants the public to understand that COVID-19 vaccines are being held to the same safety standards as all vaccines. COVID-19 vaccines were tested in large clinical trials to make sure that they meet these safety standards. Many people were recruited volunteer and volunteered to participate in these trials to see how the vaccines offer protection to people of different ages, races, and ethnicities, as well as those with underlying and different medical conditions. Vaccine data is reviewed by independent committees composed of scientific and clinical experts before these vaccines were authorized by the FDA to be administered. The FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, and the CDC monitor vaccine safety and side effects as these vaccines are being delivered. We're certainly thankful to leaders like Senator Singleton, who was vaccinated, and uh, to CEO Poland for the same reason, and who, who are willing to speak publicly about why it is essential for individuals from communities of color to get vaccinated. 
Our minority and multicultural populations in the state have been disproportionately impacted by this virus. Latinx and black populations have mortality rates that are nearly double those of the white non-Hispanic populations in New Jersey. Young Hispanic males are near, nearly three times more likely to die from this disease than their white counterparts. Black women and men are two times as likely to die from this disease as their white counterparts. Vaccination is one of the important steps we can take to protect ourselves, our families, and our communities. When we reach our goal of vaccinating 70% of the adult eligible population, hopefully, hopefully that will provide the community protection, the herd immunity that we need so that this virus has no place to go. To set that goal, educational information sessions like this one are vital to help share the facts about the vaccine, but also to answer questions and provide answers to your concerns. So thank you once again, Senator Singleton, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. I am joined today by Dr. Meg Fisher, special advisor uh, to the Department of Health, a pediatric infectious disease a specialist who is willing to uh, help with answering your questions as well. Commissioner, thank you. Dr. Fisher, it's always a pleasure to see you as well. And Dennis, thank you too for the time that you've all given us. So one of the things that, that I'd like to do now, uh, I asked uh, many in the community um, that I was going to host this conversation um, with two experts right now, three experts actually, about what we're facing on the ground here in New Jersey. And I asked them to submit to me some questions. And if you don't mind, I'm just going to go through them um, because I think they're on, the, they're on the, the forefront of a lot of folks' minds. Um, so, uh, Commissioner, I'll start with you. And if you want to pivot to Dr. Fisher on this, that's fine. The, the first question I have is, is, does the vaccine stop the vaccinated person from getting COVID, whether that's giving COVID to others, or does it only stop the vaccine recipient from getting sick? Um, and, and I ask that because if, 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 if I or someone had already had COVID and recovered, do they also still need to get vaccinated? Now, I, I got to tell you, this series of questions, and Dennis, I'm, I'm going to ask something similar of you. When we asked folks to send us questions, everybody had this in their thing, right? Everyone said, well, if I get COVID vaccine, I'm not now invincible. Do I get to walk around with a cape on, basically? So, so Commissioner, can you help me understand, does the vaccine stop the vaccinated person from giving or getting COVID? All right, so let's start with what the vaccines actually do. Uh, the vaccine actually teaches your immune system how to recognize and fight the virus that causes COVID-19. And this protects you from getting sick with COVID-19. We are not sure if the vaccine will stop you from getting infected, but we are sure that it will stop severe disease and mortality from occurring once you get vaccinated. So can you get the virus? Perhaps you can, but your body says, oh, wait a second, we're not gonna let this virus take hold of you and you will not get sick. Can you pass the virus on? There's a possibility. And that's why we always say, continue to mask up till this virus has no place to go. Continue to safeguard, mask up, wash your hands frequently. Uh, if you're sick, get tested, but on the other hand, Make sure you get vaccinated. And as we learn more about the virus and the vaccines, we will be able to give you more direction in this regard. What we do know is it prevents hospitalizations, severe disease, and death. So, Commissioner, just to, uh, as a follow-up, just at that last point. So, if you're someone who already had COVID and recovered, do you still need to be vaccinated or do you have enough antibodies in you that now you're protected? I'm going to let Dr. Fisher uh, weigh in here. Sure, I'm happy to weigh in on that. So yes, we do want you to get vaccinated, even if you've already had the disease, because we think it will boost your protection and protect you more, uh, protect you better and longer. Now, how quickly do you need to get vaccinated? If you just had the disease yesterday, 
we don't want you coming to the vaccine site. You're still contagious and we don't want you to, to come for vaccine. And we don't know that you need it. We know from the natural disease that you're protected for about three months. So you can safely wait for those three months. And it may even be longer than that, but you can wait, particularly now that the vaccine's in short supply. But for people who were affected during that first wave of disease back in March and, and last April, you should get vaccinated now to boost that antibody, protect you against the strains that are circulating today. Thank you. Dennis, just you talked about supply and demand, right? Supply and demand of the of the vaccine. And I I seen firsthand the operation that, that virtual runs at our mega site. It's it's efficient, it's it's professional. The folks are so courteous. And you 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 gave a, a beautiful shout out to the entire team that makes this happen, the, the many hands that are at work that are doing this. So if and when supplies grow, can the mega site continue to expand to meet that demand? Yeah, Senator, absolutely. You know, uh, we are far from uh, reaching our ceiling in terms of capacity. As I mentioned, we are right now routinely doing, you know, 4,000 doses on a given day. Uh, we truly feel we can ramp that up to about 6,000 per day, but it's all dependent upon supply. And as um, federal government releases it, the state has done a wonderful job in making sure we get it as quickly as we can, and we're trying to put it in arms as quickly as we can. And so uh, to date, we've done over 80,000, and we hope by the end of this weekend, we will have surpassed the 100,000 mark. Um, again, it's just all a, a function of available supply. So, so then, you know, the crux of our conversation here today is about uh, informing minority communities about why this is important. And as an African American, as a, as a healthcare professional, healthcare leader, what what advice can you give specifically to our communities of color in which there's great hesitancy about the vaccine process and the vaccine in and of itself? What advice can you lend to that? You know, Senator, I, I think the first thing I would do is that, one, I would truly hope and I would encourage people to take advantage of the vaccine. I mean, I think as the commissioner mentioned, as you mentioned, the, the coronavirus has disproportionately impacted people of color. You know, the same group that suffer from higher rates of obesity, higher rates of diabetes, asthma, those chronic conditions that make us more susceptible to the virus. And so my concern is that we see that the people who need the vaccine most are also the same people who are most reluctant to getting it. You know, there's been reports that, that show that of all people who have received the vaccine in the U.S., I'm going beyond the state of New Jersey, uh, thus far, only about 5% are, are Black. You know, Black Americans represent between 12 and 14% of the overall population. And so you can see that there's clearly a gap. And I, I don't think there's an easy answer, but I do think there are two things that need to happen. Uh, one is, I think, health systems and government agencies need to take proactive measures to ensure that the vaccines are uh, accessible to all people and all communities. I think we have to be willing to engage, educate, and have tough, transparent discussions, very much like what we're having today. And then secondly, and maybe even more importantly, is that Black leaders like myself, like you, need to be willing to speak up and step up. You know, whether it's having town halls like this or having one on one conversations with friends, with coworkers, with family members, uh, Senator, I think we have to lead by example. And that is why you did what you did, what I did, um, and being very public about 
the reasons I, I took the vaccine. And we need to continue to do that. And we need to encourage others to do that. That well said. And, and I think your, your, your mantra of speak up and step up for those in, in the African-American community to be leaders to talk about the vaccine and why it is critically important that we do it is going to be essential for us moving beyond. So thank you for that. Uh, Commissioner, um, one of the bigger questions that come up, and, and, and I know you and Dr. Fisher will be able to help give us some um, sense of this, are what is the percentage of New Jersey's population that needs to be vaccinated for us to have the herd immunity that you talked about earlier? We've set a goal of 70% of the eligible adult population. That goal was not just, you know, someone's dream. It's really based on what we know about the virus at this point in time. And we know that, you know, experts like Dr. Fauci, who have, you know, studied this for years, uh, set the goal around 70%. He said it could be as high as 80 to 85% as we learn more about how this virus acts. Uh, we're hoping that if we vaccinate 70% and for those that have natural immunity because they've had the disease and have built up antibodies, that we will approach that 80, 85% of the population and stop this virus from transmitting from one person uh, to the next. Uh, so we, we feel comfortable with that percentage, but I do have to say we learned something about this virus every single day. And every single day there's new information. I keep trying to remind ourselves here at the department and every time I have a forum like this, this is what we call a novel coronavirus up to a year ago, never before seen in humans, never before seen. So we are learning, uh, the governor likes to say, we're building the uh, airplane as we're flying it. And we're applying that those new learnings every single day in our approach uh, to vaccinations. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner, another question that has come up a lot, and I'm, I'm hopeful, and this is our this is a real talk conversation, and I'm and I'm so appreciative of it. Are the ingredients in the COVID-19 vaccine? Because there's a lot of talk out there. You know, some folks, internet doctors, want to tell you what's in it and to, and, and make that uh, pronouncement. But can you give us a sense what is actually in the COVID-19 vaccines? What are the ingredients? Well, I actually have a list of the ingredients, and if I could pronounce them all, I'd be happy to do it. But I will tell you clearly, clearly, it does not contain eggs. What we have right now, the uh, Pfizer and Moderna, there are no preservatives. That's what makes it so difficult, the vaccine stewardship that, that uh, um, Dennis uh, speaks of, making sure that they're refrigerated at the at the right temperature and that they're that the vaccine is given within the right uh, uh, time frame. And you know, preservatives have always been in question when, uh, rightly or wrongly, mostly wrongly, when we talk about vaccines. Uh, it doesn't contain latex, which we know is something that individuals are extremely um, uh, sensitive to. Uh, so we know clearly that these vaccines are uh, much different than some vaccines of the past. And we do know they are safe and effective. We monitor every adverse uh, event uh, from something as simple as a little pain in the arm and I bet we all had that <laughs> when we got vaccinated, little pain in the arm, sort of like a flu shot, to even those individuals who two to three weeks later, for maybe another reason, uh, has, have to be in the emergency room or hospitalized. We know every single adverse event with post-vaccination. So we're monitoring all of that. I'd be happy to tell you that um, the, the vaccine includes um, what they call lipids, which are fatty substances, um, hydroxybutyl lipid. I don't know whether that means anything to anybody. Uh, uh, hexol, hexol decalinoid. De How'd I do, Dr. Fisher? <laughs> I would never say it because I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to give you an example. I, I, but I think what most people have to realize 
is that these vaccines uh, are so carefully manufactured uh, that the vaccine stewardship, the, the care of these vaccines is so important at all of our vaccine administration uh, sites because there are no preservatives. Senator, I, I think if I might add to what um, the commissioner was saying, please. One of the, the, the biggest things that I think she talked about wasn't what wasn't in it, but the real thing is it is not a live virus. You know, at the end of the day, that is the one thing that I have had to really talk to people about to get to get them to understand they were not being injected with a live virus. I, I appreciate that. I, and, and I was I was hoping the commissioner was going to tell me about this new microchip that they put in me because I've heard that too. <laughs> I got new microchips in me since I've been vaccinated now. And 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 I say it tongue in cheek though, Commissioner, because I know you and Dennis and Dr. Fisher, you guys have been living with this on, on such a daily basis. And as as folks who believe in science, you know, Dr. Fisher's her whole life's been built on the uh, on understanding science and what it means. I can only imagine the frustration that it must be when we, we see folks who are putting out information and frankly that misinformation is harming all of our communities but but dennis knows because i know he has spoken to to african-american groups african-american employees of, of his facility and i have as well this misinformation is really putting people's lives in jeopardy and, and i think the the thrust of our conversation here is to say this vaccine is safe and we really need everyone to, to participate, sign up to get vaccinated so we can move forward. Um, Dennis, if I could, you you and I had a conversation where you talked about almost like you're running two health systems, right? You're running virtual proper and the vaccine site. And because of the, the mission and why that mission is so important and, and virtual is devoted, you know, countless amount of financial resources and time of his staff, et cetera. So a simple question, like why? Why have you all decided to step up and do this? What? Why? Yeah, you, you know, part of Virtuous brand promise is to to be here for good. You know, and and honestly, Senator, that's what we're here for. You know, when you talk about Burlington County, Virtuous roots date back to 1880. You know, it wasn't called Virtua back then, but it's the same organization that opened the very first hospital in all of South Jersey. Um, it's our mission, it's, it's our DNA, is to help people be well, get well, and, and stay well. We've been taking care of COVID patients now for really uh, I, I, a year, I guess, isn't it, Commissioner, as of, uh, of this week? We're now you know, a year in. We've seen the suffering and the loss firsthand. And now we have a vaccine that can help put a stop to it. And so that's why we're so committed to vaccinating the community. And that's why I ask everybody in the community to, to deeply consider it. And we've tried to take a mega site and make it as welcoming of an environment as possible you know, things having wheelchair escorts available. You know, we went so far as to create a sensory room to accommodate um, some of our residents with special needs, you know? And so, and I think the beauty of this is that the mega site is a partnership and that partnership has really allowed us, I think, to do great things. And I am so pleased not only that myself and Virtua is in a position, you know, to do this. As a, as a healthcare CEO, I think I have a responsibility to create communities of wellness, you know, to make sure that everything we do is to uplift the overall health and well-being of the communities that we are so fortunate to serve. And, and I don't think that is unique to Dennis Pullen. I think if you talk to many of my counterparts throughout the state, you will see that that's at each and every one of our course is to, to be able to improve the overall health and well-being 
of, of our communities. And it has such trickle down effect. You know, when you have a healthy community, it lends itself to economic prosper. It, it is just widespread. And so that's why we do it, because it's the right thing to do. Well said, well said. And so and we all are so appreciative of, of Virtua stepping up and doing that. Uh, Commissioner, just if, if I can, just one or two more. Um, again, in the in the avenue, this next question. Commissioner, I'm sorry, I, I think I lost my connection there. In, in the avenue of uh, dispelling rumor, uh, there's a lot of rumors that are out there online and, and everywhere else about the vaccine and its negative impact on fertility. So a couple questions. One, are those rumors true? If it is, and I know there's a very particular molecule in the vaccines that some have said uh, alter patients' genes. I think it's that mRNA is, is what I've been told. Can, can you talk to me first about the fertility question? And then secondly, if you wouldn't mind addressing this question about does the vaccine alter patients' genes? Well, they, those questions actually go hand in hand. Uh, so let's just talk first about messenger RNA. Messenger RNA is de the delivery method uh, that actually kind of tricks the um, spike protein. That's if you've seen the um, infographics about the, uh, the virus that causes um, uh, COVID. Uh, it's, it's a round ball with spikes on it. And it tricks the spike protein into recognizing it and build a, 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 recognizing it as uh, COVID-19 and your body starts an immune response. That messenger RNA never enters the nucleus of your cells in your body. The nucleus of the cell in your body is where your unique DNA resides. So it never gets there. And it really just is tricking your body into saying, oh, there's a foreign substance here. I'm going to build an immune response to it. And those antibodies then give you your immune response. Now let's talk about fertility. There is absolutely no scientific evidence that fertility is impacted by either the mRNA or the immune response, the antibodies that you're building up. There is absolutely no scientific evidence that it causes problems with pregnancy, no scientific evidence that any fertility uh, uh, issues or problems are a side effect of uh, any uh, vaccine, um, and particularly the, this, these uh, mRNA vaccines. Uh, Meg, uh, Dr. Fisher, do you have anything to add? Just uh, the only thing I would add is, is to remind people that the messenger RNA doesn't stay in your body. Mm -hmm. It's actually uh, degraded and it's gone within a day or two. So, so, so this is nothing, that, this isn't, that the messenger RNA doesn't stay with you. What stays with you is the protection, your body's immune response to that spike protein that's on the outside of the virus. So that stays with you, but the messenger RNA is long gone. Dr. Fisher, what if, if you wouldn't mind, then can I, can I just pivot quickly to a, a separate conversation on the second dose shot? Because there's sure. a lot of conversation out there that like, you'll, you'll get your first dose and you'll be be bopping around and then your second <laughs> dose, whoa, watch out. And I know and, and I know everybody reacts differently, right? So I will react react it differently than Dennis will, than whomever will. But is there any sense to this conversation around the second shot and what its effects are on the body? So in the studies, in fact, people did seem to have more reactions to the second shot. Uh, for me, the good news was if you happen to be older than 55, you didn't have as many uh, as much response to the vaccine. But um, it's not, they're not severe reactions. So it's, I feel lousy. I have some fever. I have aches and pains. And what those are symptoms of is the fact that your immune system is working to protect you. So if you, everybody thinks of them as adverse effects. And in, in fact, we don't like it when we don't feel well. But the good news is that's your body making that immune response 
and protecting you. Now, I don't want to stress that too much because then people get nervous. What if I didn't have a response? Does that mean I didn't make antibody? That is absolutely not true. It's just as you said, Senator, everybody reacts differently. Some people more, some people less. But the good news is we know that this vac these vaccines are very, very effective and, and very good at protecting you. So, Senator, I was one of those individuals on my first shot. I literally had to try and remember which arm I actually got the shot in, you know, <laughs> because my Band-Aid fell off. Uh, and I just, I couldn't remember. And so it was absolutely without pain, no problems. My second shot, and I got the Pfizer, um, as, as the good doctor said, um, the next day I was sluggish, sort of lethargic, uh, a little minor low grade fevers and gave me an excuse to lay in bed and watch football all day, which I, I did. Um, but within 18, maybe 24 hours, I was up and back to my old self with, with no residual effects. And I have to tell you, I would vote for that 24 hours of feeling a little lousy as opposed to dealing with the potential negative effect of contracting a potential deadly disease. And so when you sort of weigh the two, can I put up with feeling like crap for 24 hours? Or can I walk with a degree of confidence that I am not going to put my family at risk, my friends at risk, my colleagues at risk, and, and, and my own health at risk by doing what has proven to be scientifically our best protection against this dreaded disease? That is, you, you said something to me uh, probably two months ago. And, and, and Commissioner, I've heard you say it as well, almost to the sense that if the general public could actually walk through a COVID ward and visibly see what the ravages of this disease does, that there it would compel you. There wouldn't be this hesitation to sign up for a vaccine because what this dreaded disease does to the body and seeing folks we have to be intubated and intubated and looking at the, the horror that it places on families where we pass nationally this 500,000 death mark, um, which which saddens me to, to no end. It is why I, I, I knew this conversation was so important to have. And I, I just want folks to understand there was not a moment's hesitation from the commissioner or Dennis to say yes. I want to be a part of this conversation because we need to make sure people understand why this vaccine program will save lives and move us forward. So I, I, I want to thank you, you both, both for that. Um, Dennis, a, a, as we close, come to a close, I want you to do two things. And then, Commissioner, I'm going to ask you to wrap it up for us, if you don't mind. Uh, Dennis, I want you one more time, if you don't mind, please let people know how they can sign up. And, and again, uh, uh, for those who are skeptical, one more time an appeal to make sure they sign up to get vaccinated, especially those in the African-American community. Uh, uh, absolutely, Senator. So once again, I think everybody in the region should visit virtua.org slash vaccine. And by filling out the form, you'll be able to receive alerts that'll tell you when new appointments are added to the schedule. And we are adding appointments as we have a line of sight on the vaccine and we will continue to do so. You'll also be able to find frequently asked questions and even a video tour to help you know exactly what you can expect when it's your turn to get uh, get vaccinated. And if I, if I might add one other thing, because we have a lot of seniors uh, who might have limited access um, to computer or just people in general that uh, may have limited access. Without question, the computer is the most effective way to register. But we also understand that there are many that might have limited access or if they're like myself, limited computer skills. And so we do have a phone number by which people can call. But I want to be upfront and let them know that there may be some delays in reaching someone because of such high demand. But that number is 
888-847-8823. Once again, 888-847-8823. And then the last part of your, your, your request in terms of encouraging people that look like you and myself in particular and the importance of that. You're right. Um, I make a point to visit our hospitals on a regular basis and, and visit our ICUs. And it is painful to see the devastation that occurs as a result of this disease. And the devastation, not just on that person in the hospital bed, but their extended family and what it has done to, to many, to, to the staff that is impacted. But Senator, I don't wanna take lightly some of the concerns and some of the hesitancy that we find in our communities of color because it is real. And so because of that, I think it's necessary if it's one person at a time, we take one person at a time and try and help them see the light through better as the commissioner did, better helping them to understand the science and once you can get past the science, helping them to better understand the trust factor. Um, and, and in closing, I will tell you, I was meeting with one of our, what we call colleague communities at Virtua, and a young lady, um, African-American, told me that she wasn't going to take it until she saw someone that looked like her, but was in the know and in a position of power. And so what she was doing was she was describing me. You know, in my role, I should be well versed. I should be educated on the science and the technology. And so I should be somebody in the know. And I should be someone of influence. And so what she said to me without saying it, Dennis, I'll take it when I see you take it. When I know that you have trust and confidence. And that compelled me to not be first, but to be early, to step up and demonstrate that I felt it was the right thing to do. And as a result of that, it led many others to follow suit. And I will continue to do that. You know, I was so appreciative when the, the commissioner and the governor and yourself came over to the, to the mega site, such that not only that the residents that were there being vaccinated saw it, but the staff that was working there saw it. It gave us an opportunity to create a narrative and put that narrative out there that it is the right thing to do. And all of us that are in the know are doing this. So thank you for including me in this discussion. And I, I, I really appreciate the fact that you are stepping up and, and taking some ownership in protecting our community. So thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you for your insights. Thank you for your candor, as always, and friendship and, and, and what you're doing to safeguard our communities. Uh, Commissioner, uh, I've said this in multiple venues, um, said it to you, and, and I want the, the world to hear. Yeah. I think the, the, the leadership that you have exhibited uh, during this time, unprecedented times that no one gets a gets a prerequisite. There's no prerequisite course in being a commissioner working through a pandemic. No one in our lifetime has actually seen what it takes. I, I think the work that you've done and, and, and the leadership that you've provided has given a sense of calm to many of us. Um, and, I'd, and I'd ask you as we close this out to, to again, offer some comments. Um, again, why this is so critically important, especially in communities of color and, and the work that you all have done frankly, to expand other avenues for the vaccine to get in communities of colors with the partnerships that you all have recently established through faith leaders and, and other organizations. Uh, so, Commissioner, if you could, again, thank you so much, but could you just give us uh, some closing thoughts on, on why this is important? Uh, sure. Thanks so much, Senator, for, for um, hosting this roundtable. Because first and foremost, the best way to combat myths and hesitancy is through knowledge. And what you're doing today is imparting knowledge. More importantly, you imparted it because you listened. People need 
to be listened to. Communities of color need to have a voice and they need to be listened to. And they need to be in forums where they feel comfortable using their voice. That's why we have kicked off a vaccination partnership uh, that uh, uh, connects us with our faith-based leaders. And we are going into churches. Uh, we are setting up with uh, uh, FEMA and the state police and uh, Office of Emergency Management uh, sites going to where the people are, where they feel comfortable so that they can be heard and that we can be present to them and bear witness to what's important to them in places of worship and in communities where they live and where they want to protect one another. We have over 20,000 deaths in New Jersey. If you do the math, one in about 500 individuals have died from COVID-19 in New Jersey. One in 500 individuals. It's only together, and we must do this together, can we stop this virus. Together, we can stop the virus. Together, if we get vaccinated and support one another, if we get vaccinated for ourselves, for our loved ones, for our communities, we can stop this virus. And it's only by joining together will we have a future better than the present we live in right now. So thank you so much, Senator. Knowledge is power and power will overcome this virus. Commissioner, thank you for the eloquence and the direct message. So thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Fisher, thank you for being with us as well, imparting your knowledge and your wisdom. Um, it's, our, it's my hope that through our collaboration here and our conversation that we've tried to dispel some myths and, and really encourage people to, to sign up for appointments so that they can get vaccinated because that is the only way we get back to a healthier and safe society where we can create a new normal uh, as we move forward. So thank you all for being with us uh, here today. And again, it is our hope that we were able to, to move this conversation forward in a positive direction and see more people get vaccinated. So thank you all so much. God bless each and every one of you. And I look forward to seeing you all in person down the road. So thank all you. Right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Senator. Sure. Thanks, Dennis. Good to see you. Thanks.